It's my pleasure to introduce Pam Brunsfeld. It's a special pleasure. She's my colleague. She's my friend. I have always admired your expertise as a botanist. You've been a professional botanist, I understand, for 50 years. And in, in all the time I've known you, you're so willing to share your enthusiasm and knowledge with anybody who asks, as far as I can see. My students, when I taught at the University of Idaho, would go and ask Pam for help. You know, they could bring in these little dried up plant specimens and say, tell me what it is. And uh, many of them knew her from taking systematic botany with her. Um, that was said it's so challenging, but also really entertaining. Uh, Pam is the retired director of the Stillinger Herbarium at the University of Idaho, where she was really instrumental in establishing the Consortium of Pacific Northwest Herbaria. Um, and in that role as former director, she mentored a lot of students who are now uh, professional botanists in many places, and certainly lots of enthused, plant enthusiasts. Pam runs uh, Brunsfeld Botanical, uh, a company conducting botanical surveys throughout Washington, Idaho, and Oregon, mainly for endangered and threatened plants, but also uh, currently identifying blue square prairie remnants for Whitman County. We all, um, honored Pam recently with the White Pine Award from our chapter for her many contributions to our chapter. She helped, maybe the state does Pam. <laughs> you helped uh, establish the White Pine chapter here. Um, you were the first secretary, you served as president, vice president, and secretary. And then the love for the state um, as well. One of our, my favorite parts is that you've led so many field trips for us. You've long been friends. We've known each other as parents, neighbors, and colleagues. Her son, Nick, who's in the audience, and my daughter, Sarah, went to school together. Was it in Moscow Day School as well? <laughs> elementary, middle school, and high school. Um, so that's a treat for us. I'm delighted to introduce to you Pam. And she's going to tell us about finding amazing flowers. So, as a lifelong botanist, I really, really, really love plants, and I really, really don't love things. <laughs> So the late winter spring, after I retired, I read there was going to be a super boom in Death Valley, and I decided that was something I would like to do. So we missed the super bloom. We went down there, and we missed the super bloom, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But it was so warm, and there were so many plants new to me, that I decided I would like to visit the Southwest every spring. I've been lucky enough to witness three super blooms, one in 2017, one in 2019, and one in 2023 that I want to share with you this evening. Now we need to get down. <laughs> <laughs> Are you I mean, on the computer. What's that? Oh, maybe we didn't start the uh, slide show. I did. Ava saves the day. Oh, I don't know about that. But. I did. Oh, so, yeah, if you click. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, so what is the A super bloom is a breathtaking natural phenomenon that occurs in California and Arizona when an unusually high proportion of wildflowers whose seeds have lain dormant in the soil in the desert soil germinate and blossom all at once. They say that usually these seeds lay dormant 10 to 15 or up to 20 years before they before they sort of start to bloom. Up to 200 different species may bloom, resulting in a stunning lamp display of color and vitality across an arid or desert landscape. 
So basically what you see is what you saw in that original photo. The landscape is just covered with millions and millions of flowers. So this is just kind of give you an example. This is an aerial photo from the 2017 Super Bowl. Uh, this is in the Joshua Tree area where we saw the Super Bowl. We can see what the desert looks like in winter, and we can see what that desert looks like in the Super Bowl, just the intensity of flowering. So what causes a super bloom? These three things need to play together in perfect symphony to get a super bloom. Of course, rain. But rain needs to fall in a certain pattern. So you need to have a half inch or more fall in September or October to get down into those seeds and top of that seed coat. Interestingly enough, an El Nino weather pattern is perfect for a super bloom, which is what we are experiencing right now. Last year it was La Nina, but we still got a super bloom. Um, so you need to have that regular rain throughout the season so the seeds don't dry out. Okay, secondly, and I have found this to be the least problematic of these three variables, and that is the warming up of the seeds. So basically, you have these seeds that are germinating, you need to have that continued, you know, gradual warming. But then here's something that most people don't realize. What you need to have is you need to have at least two days of blasting heat. So everything pops, pops at once. And that's sort of one of the main variables and to get a super bloom. And thirdly, harsh desert winds. Remember how I told you that Death Valley didn't work out for us? There was a super bloom, but the harsh desert winds came through and wiped everything out. So you can't get these harsh desert winds that either will remove those seedlings or even remove the super bloom. I will say, for those of you that have never been to Death Valley, be ready for wind. The worst windstorm I've ever been in was in Death Valley. Um, the sand came in and took out tents, and the tents that it didn't blow away, they were buried in sand, literally, right? So during a super bloom, what you're going to see are millions and millions of annuals. So annuals only live to be a year. Um, the seed to germinate, flower, hopefully set seed, die. That's it. Those seeds remain dormant from that plant until the next time that they get the nice conditions to germinate. So what we call these is we call them ephemerals because they are fleeting and short-lived. Um, but during a super bloom, these annuals flower in mass and bring in pollinators that would not otherwise visit the deadly floor. So because you have so many flowers flowering, it brings in all these pollinators, moths, butterflies, bees, insects, hummingbirds, so more seed is set. So, you know, in my mind, they think more super blooms could be causing more super blooms. And there's more super blooms because of climate change. So there's one instance where climate change may not be bad. Um, whenever I talk about pollinators, I point this out, and it's not everybody realizes this. But pollinators see in a different light, insects see in a different light spectrum than we see in. We see in red through violet. They don't see red. They see in orange through ultraviolet. So this is just for an example of things, how we see a crocus, how they see a crocus. How we see a dandelion, how they see a dandelion. How we see, I'm gonna show you the species, this is the Celia canisidifolia. This is how we would see it. This is how they see it. It's all like fluorescent, and the these look like, kind of like sparklers. So you can imagine if you're a pollinator, and there's food, pollen, nectar, and a neon party light show, you know, <laughs> I'm going there, right? Oops. So where did we go? This is the area we visited in March and April 2023 where the super bloom was best. Interestingly, this phenomenon does not usually occur in the entire Southwest, and blooms are better in certain areas due to the variation of those precise factors that I just discussed that cause super blooms. In 2017, it was best in Joshua Tree National Park. I've not had a super bloom there since then. In 2019, the area we visited this year was good, but even better in Arizona, and that's where we went. And this is the area my research uh, reported was the best for 2023, and indeed it was. So we started in the, oops, the Animal Valley Poppy Preserve, now I'm going to take you up through the Mojave Desert, over here, and drop down on the Parisian Plain. Parisian Plain is mindful. 
Okay? If you find the rest of this glory, you won't find this glory. <laughs> so, here we are, leaving Idaho right? <laughs> on March day, right? Here we are two days later. This is the uh, Animal Valley Poppy Reserve. Um, just a, an aerial photo and then a photo on the ground. And let me tell you a little bit about Animal Valley Poppy Reserve. Uh, it is a state protected reserve located in the northeast corner of Los Angeles County, right outside of Lancaster. The microclimate makes it the best poppy berry, poppy berry area in California. In fact, Lancaster has a California poppy festival every year. Of course, this area has to get the same conditions necessary as any super bloom to get this intensity of flowering. Oops. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to show you these areas without a super bloom and how they look like with a super bloom. So here is this area in Animal Valley, just normal. And here's what it looks like with a super bloom. Okay, for some of you that know me, <laughs> you might find this park. Okay, during this presentation, I will give you the common name, the scientific name, the family name, and there will be some editorial comments by me about taxonomic craziness. <laughs> you can take as much or as little of you want that, uh, as you want on this, and you can just ignore the whole thing and just look at the pretty pictures, okay? <laughs> but as a botanist, I can't help myself. So, sorry. California poppy, or golden poppy, is the Schultzia californica and Pat Pavaresi, the poppy family. Um, it is native in California. In the late 1700s, Spanish settlers affectionately called the poppy Copa de Oro, meaning cup of gold. This is cool. There is even speculation that California is called the Golden State because of the California poppy, and not the gold that was mined there. Cool. By 1816, Russian explorers officially named the flower Schultzia californica, and in 1826, the famous Scottish botanist David Douglas, which some of you might be familiar with, Douglas Burr's named after him. Anything that has the name the glassy eye in it is named after him. He was a famous um, botanist from Scotland that collected all over um, in the early 1800s on horseback in the Pacific Northwest. Well, he took seed back to the Royal Horticultural Society of England in 1826 and now it's a common species in British gardens. Um, how many of you have seen this growing around here? Okay, well. It is here because it has come in some nasty wildflower mixture, which I call weeds in a cane. So what these are, are they're non-native species that will grow very well and now compete our natives. So, here. Um, this little yellow aster here, you're going to be seeing a lot of during this, during this slideshow. So here are some poppies. And here are poppies as far as the eye can see. Now, I would like to introduce you to two of my assistants. <laughs> this is Callie, and she is a seasoned botanist. And this is Salix, which is Latin for Willow. He's only five years old. And this was his first trip doing botany work. Um, they are here. Uh, I'll show you uh, Twitter slides with them for scale. And I also think they are adorable. So, there's my puppies. So we're leaving Antelope Valley, we started to head north and um, through the Mojave Desert, we started seeing Joshua trees. Joshua trees are Yucca brevifolia. They are endemic to Mojave Desert, meaning they only occur in the Mojave Desert. They are truly an amazing, amazing plant. It is a monocot, so it does not have true wood like dipots and conifers. You know, monocots are things like grasses, sedges, lilies, don't have true wood. But the trunks undergo secondary thickening through a completely different, separately evolved mechanism that only Joshua trees have. Without the continuous layer of cambium, we see conifers and dicots. So you might remember in your botany class that dicots and gymnosperms 
have a continuous layer of vascular cambium around the outside that creates plum to the outside where sugars go through. And then in the inside is xylem, the water goes through, and that's where the wood is. The Joshua trees don't do it that way. They have their own uh, separately and own mechanism. So here's a, oh, here's a cool picture, I thought, of a Joshua tree. Here's what they look like. I've never seen one. And those are the inflorescences at the top, okay? They grow two to three inches a year, take 50, 60 years to reach their full height, and they live to be about 500 years old. So here's the inflorescence of the Joshua tree. If you look at this flower, it has one, two, three, four, five, six carrying parts, right? These are actually three petals, three sepals, in lilies, tulips, we call them tepals. That, when there are multiples of three, you're a monica. It has six stamens, it has this histole, the female part is in it, three carpels, parts of three. Perfectly good lily ACE. If you're, you know, clap, uh, textbook lily ACE, you can see, I'm just because just we're so upset. Um, <laughs> well, Joshua trees used to be in the lily family. Okay, but then this is the taxonomic craziness. This is editorial comment number one. Then they decided to move all these things out of all the AC into all of these other families. Joshua trees are now in the asparagus family. That's <laughs> family AC. But they are in the above of some subfamily, Agnoboidae. Okay, silly. There is also a fascinating coevolution story about Joshua trees and their sole pollinator, the yucca moth. Only yucca moths pollinate Joshua trees. In fact, in a letter, Darwin deemed it the most wonderful case of fertilization ever published. So I obviously need to share it with you. Joshua trees do not have nectar to go out in most pollinators, but the yucca moth, Tigaticula yuccella, has jaw appendages. See those orange jaw appendages? There, there. That's one pollen and deposit on the female part of the next flower of the Joshua tree inflorescence. In turn, the moth lays her eggs with its thin, blade like hole depositor on the flower seeds. They have the teeth in there. There's kind of a cartoon. There's actually the caterpillar. And those caterpillars, when they hatch, eat about half of the plant's 200 seeds. That is their only food source. So two species, neither, which would exist without the other. The yucca and the yucca moth is sort of the classic case of coevolution. Mm -hmm. So here's a Joshua, Joshua tree forest before Super Bowl. Here's the Joshua tree forest in a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. The little yellow annual, this little yellow annual is the same one we saw with the poppies, okay? It's called common gold fields. Lusthenia gracilis in Asteraceae or the sunflower family. They are this high up the ground. They are this big around. And there are millions of them. Animals. White conditions, all flower animals. They drive along the road to come across this rock outcrop. You can see there's all those common gold fields. And then see that light yellow? Desert dandelion, now full for exploitation, also an asteraceae. You can see that those heads do look a lot like a dandelion head, but they're not related at all. I mean, except the fact that they're both an asteraceae. Um, and just to show you how dense they were, here are my models. Say, it looks like once again, showing you that the sh all these shrubs probably salt push, just that desert dandelion, as far as you can see. Now, I want to tell you a little bit. These are the real colors of these flowers, okay? The animals down there are not like the animals up here. The colors are, it's, well, it's like you're in rocks, really. So, I mean, it's really, really spectacular. So, I just wanted to give you just a few different species that we can see in the Mojave before we go to freeze and plain. So, this is common elf clover. It's actually an Indian paintbrush. It's an annual, unlike our castellas, our Indian paintbrushes, which are perennial. 
and this is Castellet and Gura subspecies Venetia. The reason why there's subspecies Venetia is see this little yellow lip there? That's going to make it subspecies Venetia. We're going to see another subspecies of Castellet and Gura. Um, this is in. Okay. This is in the family. Or basically, this is my my editorial comment, in which I my my family go fish right. There used to be a really wonderful family named Strocular ACE, the Snapdragon family. You guys familiar with that family? Well, then they decided to butcher the heck out of it. And what they did with Castellet, which was in Strocular ACE, is they put in Oral Bay ACE, which is the Blue Lake family. How many of you have ever seen Indian pipe? It has actually no core. Okay, okay, almost all of you. They decided to put this in the same family as that because it is a hemipyrus. In other words, it has some mycorrhizal fungi relationship with some other plant. Who would know that? Right? So anyway. Uh, okay. So anyway, let's get back to this here. So see this little yellow, yellow plant there? That is Mojave Sun Cup. Amazonia campestris in honor Gracie, the Indian Primrose family, which is named like the moment. Mm -hmm. The first time I went to the desert, I saw this one and the next one, and I was hooked. This isn't even as brilliant as it is in real life. It just, these plants, they just lay on this desert gravel and sand. Now the colors are so bright, and during a super bloom, they form such huge mats. It is just absolutely spectacular. So this is purple mat, name it the Nissum. And remember how I told you that once upon, upon a time there was a really nice family stock of an ACE and they butchered it? They butchered it. Okay, this is now in flying ACE, which is the family that the monkey flowers are in, which used to be strong babies. I see some of you feel the same way I do about this. <laughs> And this <laughs> smaller, small desert star, not the one that went before me. When I first saw this, I said, this is the cutest little baby I've ever seen in my life. You can see it just lays right, right on the desert floor. And they're just like looking up at you. One thing I want to say about whites in the desert is they are so much whiter than our whites. And I'm sure it has to do with how, how you see them in the white, just cleanly and pollinators. They're just so brilliant. And here is an actual monkey flower. And this is big old monkey flower. Difficult big old EI. Used to be many of big old EI, but of course, they decided to take that to an Allison climbing tree. But you can see how a pollinator, with those yellow growths there, how a pollinator might see that and be like, be very attractive to it. Of course, the animalists have a lot of nectar, great pollen reward. This is one of my favorites. And it's my favorite for several reasons. This is Perry's Lyanthus, Lyanthus Perii. It's actually in the Phlox family, Polymoniaceae. One of the reasons that you know that is see those three stigma lobes there. This is an example of where something with, in, with three is actually a dipod. But growing right out of that, that soil. But here's the thing that's fascinating about it. Okay, so you see the lavender? And then see the white, the white ones? They're the same species. They're Lyanthus perii. And um, a single junk, a single gene controls flower color. Actually, a single locus on a gene controls flower color. And it is thought that environmental conditions determine which color will produce more seed. So in a dry year, the blue flowers produce more seed. And in a wet year, the white flowers produce more seed. So when you think about it, the typical conditions for the desert are what? Dry. So which color do you think you would see more? Blue. And that is indeed the case. You don't see that in white, but this year you did. And there's your little gold fields, your little placenia, and then the uh, lyanthus in those colors. This is white tiny chips, Lady glandulosa, and this is another example of those whites being so white. Um, we're going to see another kind of tips in Creasel Plain that I think that you're going to find a lot more striking. 
but it is nice to see some light along with all the all the yellow down there. Gia. Yeah. How many do we Chia seat? Okay. Chia is Salvia columbaria and Lamy Acee, or the mint family. You can see that those look like good mint flowers there, right? But in this case, the brass are these bristly, pointy, kind of fibrous wooden things. Um, rose, you can see it growing in patches, patches like that. Uh, this species, along with the Mexican species, Salvia hispanica, are what we call chia. And those are the seeds you buy down at the co-op. Chia seeds are superfoods that are rich in important nutrients like fiber and magnesium and have the favorable ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids, 3 to 1. Researchers said that they could help combat world hunger with climate change. And if you were wondering how to get chia, well, you can go to the food co-op or <laughs> okay, chia pets actually have chia seeds inside them. Okay, I learned things about chia pets making this presentation. Now, I think we're all familiar with the hedgehog. The hedgehog. I didn't realize that you could buy people chia pets. <laughs> so, you could buy really else. You can buy a dog to your pet, but lo and behold, you can make your pet a chia pet by buying it a chia pet costume. <laughs> okay, so back to business. So this is brown eyed primrose. Um, Petlus meaplamiformis. Once again, you can see just how white this white is. This is a species that we found pretty much everywhere down there. We found it in Death Valley, we found it in the Joshua Tree, we found it here. Pretty much grows everywhere. Remember, all of these are annuals. Everything I've been telling you so far is an annual. Uh, this is actually the evening primrose of the evening primrose family, the Enochera, California, the species. They flower in the evening, pollinated by moths. And this is the Mojave pincushion? Maybe. This is a Pinacus for sure. Maybe Zantiana. Um, remember, this is a flora that's new to me, so I still have some groups I need to work on some more. Um, this is an Asteraceae. You know, when you look in the middle of a sunflower family or a sunflower and you see all those little disc flowers where your sunflower uh, teams are? Basically, these have just those kind of flowers. There aren't that many um, genera in this group, but King Atlas is that. I just found this just stunning. This is broad flower Gilia, Gilia latiflora. There's different varieties that you find over in Joshua Tree, but this is the one we saw down on the Mojave. And I want to show you a perennial. This is uh, Sprousia ambigua in the Mallow family, Malvaceae. Uh, it's called um, desert mallow, apricot mallow, shrub mallow. It is has the largest flowers of any sclerosia. It's the most drought, drought tolerant in a wet year, which just was, it's quite striking seeing these large orange chunks in the landscape. Okay, now we're driving towards Carrizo, and this was my first time experiencing this, and I can tell you I was not impressed. Miles and miles and thousands of, not thousands, hundreds and hundreds of oil rigs, totally wiping out the landscape. Earlier in the day, we had seen hundreds and hundreds of wood, wood panels, and we had seen solar panels, and then we saw this, so I guess we saw the trifecta of energy sources, but turning west, I see the beginnings of Carrizo Point. And do you see how happy I am? <laughs> <laughs> this is Carrizo Plain National Monument. I saw this first on a wall calendar maybe about 10 years ago. And there was a picture of a super bloom. And I put it on my bucket list. It's like, this is a place I have to go. And then when all the news was coming out and I do all this research, it's like, we're going there. We're going there. Let me tell you a little bit about Carrizo Plain. 
It is the largest single grassland remaining in California, about 100 air miles north of Los Angeles. It is an arid grassland consisting of 250,000 acres that have been carved out of mountain building earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault that run through it. And there are also three other faults in the plain. The results are mountains and valleys that, re that further result in the sub alignment of ridges, ravines, and vernal pools. It has been called California Serengeti due to the spectacular panoramic landscapes, a diversity of wildlife comparable to Africa Serengeti, and has the highest concentration of threatened and endangered wildlife in California, with 15 of California's threatened and endangered plants and animals. Here may rest the future of such species as the California jewel flower, the San Joaquin pit fox, pictured right there, Mount Clover, blunt nosed leopard lizard, and giant kangaroo rat. The Carrizo Plain is also the largest protected habitat along the Pacific Flyway, making it a bird's paradise in the air. The Carrizo Plain National Monument was established in 2001 by Bill Clinton and has been called California's best kept secret. So, why is it so special? So I will tell you. No, I won't tell you. Okay. Um, so I want to give you a little lesson on the geography of Cruzo Plain. So here's Cruzo Plain. Um, it consists of two mountain ranges, the Caliente Range down here to the southwest, the Tundra Range to the northeast. It has basically one main road going through it, the Soda Lake, Soda Lake Road. It has the San Andreas Fault running right through it. And then you can cross over from the Soda Lake Road up here into the Elkhorn Road. And then there are little roads to get you up into the Trumbull Range. You can't even get up into the Palomino Range. Okay. Oh, here is where the foil goes through. Okay. Um, San Luis Obispo is here. So the thing about Carrizo Plain is it's not on the way to anywhere. The only reason that you would end up here is because you wanted to go there. So this is an aerial photo of the San Andreas Fault going through Carrizo Plain. So here's that Soda Lake Road that I told you about the main road. There's the San Andreas Fault, the Colliani Range. The Trumbull Range, obviously named appropriately, Trumbull, right? And just a reminder of the, um, it's actually a strike, a right lateral strike slip fall, San Andreas Fault, Pacific Plate going up, North American Plate going down, resulting in this topography throughout the plane. Um, it is reported the fault moves about 20 a year, but major earthquake events happen about Every 200 years, and right now it's 300 years overdue. And the ground can move 30 feet one way and 3 feet the other. So, besides looking and being so excited about these wonderful plants, you're living on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> Another reason to be excited. Okay, this is another picture. This is how regional plane, what it normally looks like and what it looks like during a super bloom. And I want to mention the roads. We went to Animal Valley and thousands of people, you know, us and our thousand best friends. It's not the way in Carrizo Plain. That main road, the Soda Lake Road, is paved, what was it, Jimmy, about a third of the way? About a third of the way. And the road is in such poor conditions that big hunks of asphalt come out of it and took out all water in the bottom of our little trailer. Bad, bad roads. You cross over the main road, the Soda Lake Road, and here's that other road, that Elkhorn Road that I showed you. And then these are the roads you sort of get up into, up into there. So you can imagine if you're a Californian and you have your big fancy car, you probably don't want to go there. Now, if you're from Idaho, no big deal, right? So it's great because when you're in Carrizo Plain, in the Super Bloom, there aren't that many people. It's like awesome. There's two small campgrounds, each with probably about a dozen sites. Um, but it's BLM land, so you can boot off. So people just sort of like camp 
all over outside of the designated camping spots. So it's great, you know, for people like us in this room. And I just want to mention these animals um, just, just very briefly. The um, black nose leopard lizard and pit fox, or both, the San Joaquin pit fox, are both endangered species. And the giant kangaroo rat is like a 14 inch tall rat that hops around like a kangaroo. And it just got moved from the endangered species to the threatened species list. Now, another exciting thing about Crazo play this. We, when we just got into our campground, we were told that a rattlesnake had just eaten a kangaroo rat. So there you go. Another exciting thing about kids are playing rattlesnakes. <laughs> this picture was a great excitement to me because of this plant. This is dead in a candle. This is an annual Calanthus inflatus. It used to be spread campus inflatus. Um, it is actually a mustard. It's actually in the family Brassicaceae. But you can see these inflated stems. Why? I was very excited to me. See this very well loved book? <laughs> it's on the cover of this very well loved book. And I didn't know if I was ever going to see it because it's not very common. Well, guess what? I knew it was in Carrizo Plain. Hit Carrizo Plain during a Super Bowl. There it is. Desert Camel. I do want you guys to pay attention to some of these colors. So we're going to be going over with these colors. Come from. So there it is. Now I found it really, I found it really interesting that I never really saw the flowers open. Um, you know, there are these kind of older stem flowers, and then there are new flowers. I never saw the flowers open, which I found kind of odd. But when I saw it odd, but there's those cool inflated stems. There's a candle. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I want to introduce you to the different plant species that create these different colors that sweep the landscape. So millions of annuals, remember millions of annuals who have these perfect conditions to create Mother Nature's perfect art in my mind. So the orange that covers the floor of the plain is, and this is what you see mostly on the floor of the plain, is Menzies fiddle neck, Amsinkia menziesia. Now, I am not a fan of Amsinkia nor Voraginaceae. However, this was quite stunning to see it in mass like that. That picture that I showed you, it was a little past. We got there a little bit after the, the low stuff was flattened, but we did get to hit sort of the middle and upper stuff for that reason. The purples, Pacelius, Pacelius, Pacelius. And I love Pacelius. There are eight Pacelias in Parisa Plain. And this one um, is the darkest. It's a Great Valley Oak Pacelia, sorry. This is the darkest, Pacelia ciliata, Great Valley Pacelia causing those big purple patches. Pacelia ciliata is in hydrophilaceae. Some have lumped hydrophilaceae and borogenaceae together. I, along with some other people who I greatly respect, have uh, chosen not to do that. Um, they have a different fruit type. Uh, Hydrophilaceae is a capsule, Boragenaceae is four nutlets, and Boragenaceae are thumbs, and Hydrophilaceae are nuts. So I don't know if they would have that at my dichotomous key, but it's true. Right? Yeah. Okay, then you see these patches with lighter water. A little bit lighter purple. And those are Pistelia canacetifolia. Now, remember when we looked at the UV light that the that insects see? This was the Pistelia that I had there. So you can see they're seeing this like spark force, obviously, to draw them in. So here's just these, these are Pistelias are a little past, but you can see just how dense they are. And if they were all flowering in mass, they would create that vivid patch of, of color, mild thought. Now, I didn't want you to leave thinking, oh, I only got to see a quarter of the Vesilias in Parisian Plain, so I'm giving you two more, so you will see half of them. 
This is uh, Fremont's Facelia, Facelia Fremontii, and Distant Facelia Facelia Constance. Both of these are much smaller and do not create the, the landscape, that the mass landscape color that we saw with the others. Some other blues, but they're not like the big patches that we saw earlier are lupines, and I need to get better at my lupines for sure down there. I believe this is flat sky lupine, lupinus manus, and this is a very good picture here. But at mid elevations, it'll they'll create big patches of blue. A couple of other lupines, um, Arizona lupine, perhaps lupinus arizonicus. We saw this over in Joshua Tree, and it's the only lupine down there that's purple, I think. Now, they have something that we don't know. They have a perennial lupine, like our perennial lupines, but it's a bush. It's a very large shrub. And that is Lupinus albicons, bush lupine. Isn't that magnificent? You probably noticed that by far the most we've seen are the yellow, right? Okay, the yellow, you can see it in the foreground there. And all the yellow is common hillside daisy. I'm not a big fan of common names, but this common name is perfect. It's monolopia, lanceolata, obviously an asteraceae. And you don't see a lot of the pink. I did find this aerial photo that does have a lot of pink. But we never saw that. Usually you see just like these little patches of pink there. Well, this is your old friend, Castilea Zerna. But notice how this one has a white lip, making it a subspecies of Zerna as opposed to subspecies Venusta with the yellow lip. And just a couple more Castilea pictures, just because we all love Castilea, right? But see, I'm trying to be able to recognize what some of the other things are. And um, finally, we get to see up close and personal that common gold fields that was many of bacillus. In Carrizo, you may only see it growing in goalies for the mid elevation. And here are my models. You're going to see Callie being a seasoned botanist, is tired of it. But say, let's just learn any plants he wants to. <laughs> so there's a close up of the common gold fields for senior bacillus. Okay, and of course, it wouldn't be complete without some patches of orange, but we did see a lot of patches of orange in Carrizo. Outside of Carrizo traveling home, we did, but not so much in Carrizo. But there it is, the Schultz of California. Now in this picture, see now you recognize your, your facilia can kind of see the foliage in there too. But you can, now you know that that's that common hillside daisy, that monoapia. There's your uh, great valley facilia, facilia ciliata. Remember I told you there was a nicer peggy tips in Friso? Well, here it is. Isn't it nice? And we would see it kind of at lower elevations, growing in masses like this. Um, but see, there's your little Cecilia Sildana again growing there with it. And cream cups, Heidi Stanley Calibornicus. Now, this is really interesting. Um, there are some plants that they sort of associate with Carrizo. That Heidi Tips I just showed you is one of them. Cream cups is one of them. This is what you call a monotypic genus. It means there's only one species in that genus, and this is it. Um, another thing that you can apply fascinating is you bought a pipe in there, you would look at this, and you'd go over like a lacy, right? This is actually pack houses. It's in a poppy band. So here you actually have two poppies. You have the pin cuts and you have the little shelter. Um, just, just a gorgeous little thing. And then see these little blue ones there? Okay, that is baby blue eyes, Mimophilum and ZZI. Um, isn't this something? <laughs> okay, uh, but you can see how an insect seeing a UV light, you see those nectar guys so vividly, it'd just be amazing. And this is a little bit lower elevation, too. There are a couple onions down there um, that are obviously much nicer than our onions. I mean, look at the color, you know. This is a uh, Mitchell onion, uh, 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 Gallium Um, 
Um, here's another thing when they do a little AACE. Allen used to be in the one AACE. They took it out of um, Lily AC and they put it in Amber of AC, which is the family of daffodils and snow dogs. And then some people didn't like that, and then they put it in his own family, Allen AC. So, whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, which is a really nice size onion. This is Allen Hallelui, um, Howell's onion. And we'll get sent us some places. They normally don't put up more than one common name, but I did for this because when we were in Joshua Tree, they always have like these signs like 12 most common plants you'll see. And they have this down there as the other hyacinth. It is um Bicosina capitatus, used to be Diclostemon, Diclostemon capitatum. And it's another mon another monotypic genus, only one species for that genus. Uh, when you get to Carrizo, they say, okay, we've got the tidy tips, we've got the cream cups, and we've got the blue dips. And this, this is, you know, it's one of the sort of the standards for Carrizo. And you can see it does grow all kinds of masses here. Now, this is mad, taxonomically. Um, if this is the last one, I'll go off on that one. This is in the asparagus family. Asparagaceae. Remember what else was in the asparagus family? Joshua trees. Go figure. Okay, they did put this in the subfamily Boyoidae, which is kind of fun to say, so there's that, I guess. <laughs> and remember we saw Malacolfrit's club right in the Mojave. Here we see Malacolfrit's poultry. They are divided, not only there's some morphological characters, but also one occurs in the desert and one occurs in grasslands. And no more would be complete without an astragalus. So this is Diablo locally, astragalus oxypisis. You don't see a lot of it, plants scattered here in the pure layer. Perry's mallow, Aramulki perii, flowers just kind of crawling on top of each other. They were so dense. In Malvaceae, the Mallow family. This is garden woody. This is thistle sage, Salvia cardiacea. This is probably about this tall. Absolutely stunning. As is this. They have some normal delphiniums, like our delphiniums, you know, sort of purple. But this one, in a delphinium, these, these are the petals. And the ruffle petals, and then it's quite long. I mean, this is large too. Then these uh, lavender blue sepals that are reflexed, the delphinium recurvatum, which is a lot with tiny tips, but absolutely stunning. So, being a big fan of John Muir, when I came across this quote, I, I found myself at one with John Muir. As you walk through this area, the San Joaquin Valley, where I just took you during a super bloom, and he wrote, the valley of the San Joaquin is the flowriest piece of the world I ever walked. And indeed it was. One vast level, even flower bed, a, a flower a smooth seed ruffled by the tree fringing of the river, and here and there a smaller cross from the mountain. And just to prove to you, he said, I would take one step and press 100 flowers. And to prove to you that that is the case, here's the shoe of a happy botanist. <laughs> <laughs> so you can even see the visceral, the visceral, uh, the visceral strands of pollen on my shoe. Isn't that amazing? So I hope you enjoyed the visit to the Super Bloom of 2023 in Southern California on this wonderful January evening in Osprey. <laughs> <laughs>
do we do you guys want to get me started on this or not? No. <laughs> okay, I'll make it really brief. Okay. These name changes are basically based on molecular data. Okay. In a plant cell, there are three sources of DNA. There is chloroplast DNA, there's mitochondrial DNA, and there's nuclear DNA. There are basically these name changes on chloroplast DNA because it's so easy to extract. It's really easy to extract a chloroplast DNA. That's what the problem is with chloroplast and mitochondrial DNA. They are maternally inherited. So they're making these changes based on only mom's DNA. I think they should be basing these changes on nuclear DNA, mom and dad. So there. <laughs> yeah, how many of these uh, flowers that you saw down there are are we ever likely to see anywhere else? Like maybe Ida. Well, yeah, we get super blooms in Ida. I think none of these, but we won't live to be that old, but with climate change, you know, we're, we're seeing things moving up, you know? I remember when him locking it, you know, it was like way out. It's up here now. You know, so, no, we won't see any of these. I mean, these are like, these desert annuals are so unique, and you don't really see them until you get down. I think the, the closest ones I can think of are right outside of Nevada. I mean, Las Vegas. You know, there's those red rocks there. And that's, that's about as close as you get to where you see these, these animals. Yeah. Yeah. But how far in advance can people predict when a super bloom might occur? Okay. I actually, be I actually prepared, <laughs> I actually prepared two slides because I thought somebody would ask this question. Mm -hmm. So good job, guys. <laughs> okay. Here's how you figure it out. Here's how you figure it out. And this is, you know, worst comes to worst, send me more. Okay. Because I do all the I do all the all the work here. But start by going to desertusa.com and go to the wildflower update. They have these areas listed. Okay, then you click on one of them. Of course, I click on all of them because I want to see how everything is doing. Then you end up like, okay, if, let me go back. I click on Joshua Tree. Okay, look at this. Still my beating heart. This is Joshua Tree, December 27th, 2023. Agronia, flowering already. Okay, so anyway. So you start looking at these things like crazy. And then there's all these Facebook groups. There's a crucial plant group. There's a Mohammed group. Go on and on and on and on. And people are reporting constantly what they're seeing and everything. But, and then things will be looking good. But basically, you don't know until you're there. We were there the day because of that heat blast that you have to have. We were there the day Joshua Tree did it happen. It <laughs> went from good. To a super bowl overnight. And it was magnificent. So you don't really know till the day of. So you have to be, if you want to go, you've got to be sort of, you know, like a photographer. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, man. Hi, man. That was awesome. Uh, I have a couple. Did you take a picture of the picture of those two one? No. Okay. That makes it fantastic. Um, I, I've been really wondering about seedlings and the uh, like eight species of the cilia. What is driving the species and the like, speciation of that genus in the area? I have no What's idea. Something? I have no idea. You know, I, the thing, you know, what we have, we have the cilia too, which we have three, and we only have one nice one that I know of, the cilia cerisia. All the other cilia down there are nice. Um, we have hosta and heteroclo, which are very nice, but um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they're out crosses. So, hmm. I hear you're working on a book. Can you tell me about it? <laughs> yes, I will have it done this year. And that close. So, what it is, it started out as a field guide to the plants of the inland northwest. And it was going to have it, it has a description, habitat, blooming season, all this stuff. 
And I hit a wall when I got to the grasses and the sedges and everything has a picture. And it's like, how in the world do I do this? Well, many of you know that I'm really into native plants to pollinate. I'm a beekeeper. So what I decided to do is I suddenly had this like light bulb go on and I decided, um, especially with xeriscaping and our, you know, our water needs, plant and native, they don't have drought tolerance, they're adapted to our climate. So what it is, is the 150, 150 best native plants for pollinators in the in the Northwest. And every page has pictures, and then of course the scientific name, the common name, and the family without extra work on there. And I had the description, which you can actually use it as a field guide because I did the descriptions for the field guide. And as the blooming season, the growing condition. So I made it how you can grow it. And then it has pollinator and fun facts. So it tells you what pollinates it. And then there's just, you know, there's this cool stuff about plants. So I basically have all of the written, but now I have the nasty things like the index and the intro. <laughs> but I'll give a presentation and then you can all come and buy a book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. So, any other questions? If you ever get a chance, I mean, it really is a wonderful thing for my blessings. 